In the last two videos, we've been discussing how we model in a computational fluid dynamic setting turbulent flows. So we've discussed direct numerical simulation, then large eddy simulation, and now in this video, we're going to discuss Reynolds average Navier-Stokes or RANS methods. Similar to large eddy simulation, we're first going to decompose the flow into two parts. So the velocities and the pressures will be decomposed into a mean flow, u bar, and the turbulent fluctuations, u prime. Now the big difference you'll notice here as compared to the LES is that the u bar is truly a mean flow. We're going to average as you'll see over time and so there is no time component here. So it's a steady mean flow and then all of the turbulence is being captured by the u prime. Remember in LES we had this spatial scale above which we're simulating below which we're modeling and now we're going to model all of the turbulence. So any fluctuating unsteady portion of the flow will be reflected into the U prime. So even though we use the same notation as in LES, these uh, quantities are quite different. So the way we start is we Reynolds average the Navier-Stokes equations, thus the name RANS, Reynolds averaged Navier-Stokes. If we do indeed have a steady mean flow, which is the way we'll be thinking about it here primarily, then we time average the Navier-Stokes equations. So you put in the velocity or the pressure, the actual velocity pressure signal from DNS or from experiments, and you integrate over some time window, zero to capital T. And then you divide by capital T, and as T goes to infinity, that gives you a long time average of the entire flow field. That is your U bar. That is your steady mean flow. Now, of course, in practice, we don't take T all the way to infinity. T would be some range that's large enough to capture a mean flow. So the way this might look is if you put a single probe into a flow field, and you track, say, velocity u over time, there'll be a mean, that'll be u bar, and then there'll be the fluctuating part, and that'll be u prime superimposed on the, the u bar. So what we're getting from this averaging process is the u bar, the mean flow. Now, if the underlying mean flow is unsteady, then we would use an ensemble average. So you can adapt this for unsteady mean flows. I'm gonna focus primarily on the steady case here, because that's typically the way it's being applied in practice. So we formally Reynolds average the Navier-Stokes equations. I won't go through the details. Again, as I've said in the last two videos, I want to focus on these methods from a high-level point of view and give you a sense for the advantages and the disadvantages and the issues that come up in each, and not on the details of the derivations. But when you go through the derivations, you get a continuity equation for u bar and v bar. You get an x-momentum equation, a y-momentum equation. Obviously, I'm looking at two dimensions here for u-bar and v-bar and p-bar. You'll notice convection terms, pressure gradient terms. You have the viscous diffusion terms here and here and so on. And now we have these additional terms due to the Reynolds averaging. And these are called Reynolds stresses. You'll notice that they all involve prime variables, u-prime and v-prime. So here I've listed those three uh, down here. Those are the Reynolds stresses. So we have the mean flow variables, u bar, v bar, and p bar. We would solve these equations for the mean flow, but we have a closure problem. This is the so-called closure problem in turbulence because we actually have five unknowns. If you count the unknowns in these three equations, there's u bar, v bar, and p bar, the mean flow variables, as well as u prime and v prime, the fluctuating variables. And so we have five dependent variables, but we only have three equations. Therefore, we do not have a closed system. So that is the so-called closure problem. So in order to close the problem mathematically, we need two additional equations for the five unknowns. And that's where the turbulence model comes in. People are still developing and arguing about which turbulence models are best in particular circumstances. And I'll show you the most common one on the next couple slides. So remember the turbulence model, the point is to provide this closure mathematically. So the most common approach to use is called the k-epsilon model. It's also the simplest, which is why it's most common. And it's a turbulence model for two variables, k and epsilon. The epsilon is actually the same as the epsilon we had before, and that's the rate of dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy. And here you see the definition. And then the k, that's the turbulent kinetic energy. So you see it's basically a one-half velocity squared, so it's kinetic energy per unit mass, but it's the primed variables. So it's the turbulent kinetic energy of the fluctuations. So those are two field variables that can vary with time and space. 
So two additional variables, the equations for which will then close the system. So here are the two equations, which you get from Navier-Stokes. On the left, we have, I'm, I'm writing these as material derivatives or convective derivatives with the capital D. So that's just like these terms here. So this is cap D U bar DT, and this is cap D V bar DT. So that's what these uh, represent just for shorthand. All right, so we have the convection or transport terms on the left-hand side. So there's transport of K, there's transport of epsilon. And then on the right, we have three terms in each. The three terms are the diffusion, that's the first term, the production, that's the second term, and the dissipation, that's the third term. All right, so we have diffusion, and you'll notice diffusion looks just like our other viscous diffusion terms. It's a partial squared partial x squared, essentially, but now for k and for epsilon. And then production, and then dissipation. So these are balances of k and epsilon. So two additional PDEs that we now need to solve in addition to the three PDEs for U bar, V bar, and P bar. Along with these, we'll have a closed system. Now you'll notice I've highlighted in blue and red here a whole bunch of additional constants or parameters that now come into the equation. So this is, this is a big issue as we'll, as we'll see here. First, let me define the mu sub t. This is the local eddy viscosity. We had something very similar in LES so the fluid itself, because it's a fluid, has a viscosity. It's a property of the fluid itself. Effectively, when you have small-scale turbulence, that changes the viscosity, that typically increases the apparent or effective viscosity. So that's being accounted for by this local eddy viscosity. And that relates the K and the epsilon in this way. And again, you see the C mu constant here that was in those previous equations. So then our Reynolds stresses are related to the mean flow quantities through this relationship. So you see the U primes here are being related to the U primes on the right hand side. Again, I went through that fairly quickly. The details are not important. You can look in the references I'll give in a moment to learn more about that. What I want you to see are the five constants C mu, C epsilon one, C epsilon two, sigma k, sigma epsilon, that you'll see throughout all of these equations here and here. So although we have five equations for the five unknowns, so we ha now have solved the closure problem. Now we have these five constants that we need to determine for particular classes of flows. In general, they could be obtained empirically by running a whole bunch of experiments and processing the data, or you could use DNS as we've discussed before because DNS, remember, is a numerical simulation, but it provides all the details quantitatively and qualitatively about the turbulence. We can use that information to develop turbulence models like this or to determine the constants in this case for this turbulence model. Another thing you can do is use wall functions. So near boundaries, these RANS models typically do not do very well because of the peculiarities of boundary layers and so on that happen near solid surfaces. So you can develop these wall functions. They're usually obtained from log law relationships. Not only can you use that then as a function that applies near the wall to get a better representation of the flow near the wall, but it can also significantly reduce the grid requirements near solid surfaces because that information is being taken care of by the wall layer. Sometimes that's done, sometimes it's not done. Just wanna make you aware of that. Now there's a whole mess of turbulence closure models. Sorry, shouldn't use the word mess. There's a whole host of turbulence models available. And the reason why we need so many is because none of them are right. Okay, so some are simpler, some are harder, some are more flexible, some are less flexible, some require more computation, some require less computation, some are more physically appropriate for certain circumstances. So as you can see, this gets very, very complex and there's no silver bullet from the point of view that there's not a single RANS model that applies for all turbulence flows. So we argue about which models are best for certain types of flows under certain Reynolds numbers, certain regimes, and so forth. And so there's always room for improvement with RANS. Just to mention a couple classes of models, there's Reynolds stress models. There are second order closure models. The one I showed you, Capsulon, is a first order closure model. So there's, there's just an endless supply. If you look in commercial software, you pull down the turbulence model menu, and the list just gets longer and longer every version. 
Now the big knock on RANS models is near solid surfaces, as I alluded to a moment ago, you can get boundary layers and you can get separation where you have recirculation regions in a boundary layer. RANS models are generally notoriously poor at predicting separation. Some do better than others, some do worse. And so that's one of the, the reasons why we need so many different models. We actually get much less detailed information about the flow as compared to LES and DNS. I encouraged you to look online, look at YouTube videos, see animations of DNS LES results, and they're really striking. You actually can't tell, is that a real flow or is that a simulation of the flow? They're so detailed. RAND's results are much less detailed. You're stripping out all of the turbulence that's being accounted for in the model. So the solution for U bar, V bar, and P bar, and then all these other quantities, it does not give you a lot of detail about the flow. But the whole point is, and this is why they're still the most popular turbulence models used, is that it requires significantly reduced amounts of computational resources by orders of magnitude as compared to LES and even more so as compared to DNS. So in industry, when you need results, you need them relatively quickly, you can relax a bit on the accuracy requirements and so on, these models are often perfect for these industrial types of applications. If you do want to learn more about RANS and LES, here are a couple of books that I would encourage you uh, to take a look at and, and learn more about this. I want to show you an example, and this is a very simple flow, and I'm going to show you the results for two different turbulence models in a RANS context. And I want you to see not only how different the solutions are quantitatively, so the numbers, but also qualitatively so the overall flow behavior. So this is an impinging jet. So you have a jet here. The fluid is impinging against this horizontal surface at the bottom of the domain. On the left side is a traditional k-epsilon model, as we've discussed. And then on the right side is a k-epsilon nu squared model. Oh, you think it's got more variables and parameters, so it must be better, right? So I won't get into the details of this model, but k-epsilon nu squared is another alternative. So same flow, same parameters, everything is exactly the same. Reynolds number, geometry, and everything. First of all, just look at the color map. It goes from 0 to 0 0.086 for the k-epsilon model and 0 to 0 0.049 for the k-epsilon nu squared model. So there's roughly a factor of two difference in the maximum magnitude of this quantity. Actually, what we're plotting here are the k contours, the turbulent kinetic energy. So quantitatively, the results are, are quite different by up to a factor of two. Not only that, but notice where each model predicts that the largest values of k are. In the k-epsilon model, it's right near this line of symmetry at the center of the domain, right where the jet is impinging on that lower surface. In the k-epsilon nu squared model, that region is predicted to be rather boring. You have turbulent kinetic energies that are close to zero there, and the maximum actually occurs out here, far from that center line and also a little bit displaced from the surface. So not only are the solutions quantitatively different in terms of the numbers, they are qualitatively different in terms of the overall prediction of the flow. Now, of course, the problem is I don't know which one of these is right, but unless I go through the verification validation process, I actually don't know which one is correct. So this is a problem that we have all the time with RANS. You'll get a solution, but both quantitatively and even qualitatively, you can get very different results if you use different models. So if you work in an industry and you pull down that menu and you select a model, select a model, select a different model, and you get different results, well now you're in a real pickle because you have to decide, you have to use your engineering judgment to determine which one is most accurate. Finally, I just want to finish up our discussion of turbulence models with two comments. The first is we discussed previous to this hydrodynamic stability, and then now we're discussing turbulence. These two physical aspects of fluid mechanics are usually discussed separately, often in separate books and separate courses and so forth, because mathematically and computationally, they're quite different, as you've seen if you've viewed both sets of videos. But physically, they're intimately connected. It's the instabilities that lead to transition to turbulence that leads to full-blown turbulence. 
Now we've discussed the stability aspect, we've discussed the turbulence aspect, we have not discussed the intermediate pathways, the transition pathways from an instability to a full-blown turbulent flow. That's even more complicated than these two separately. My point is that while they're separated often in books and in discussions, and in fact some people will spend their whole lives studying stability but not turbulence or turbulence but not stability, in fact physically they're very intimately connected. One is leading to the other. The other point I want to make is that in CFD, these turbulence models that we're talking about, they're on or they're off for your simulation. Now in reality, you often have regions that are laminar, regions that are transitional, and regions that are turbulent. But when you use these turbulence models, again, it's all on or all off. And so that creates a very difficult situation. You have a flow that has laminar, transitional, and turbulent regions to it but you have to turn on the model for the whole thing. So this is an area of active research, a lot of work being done, RANS, LES, and DNS. This is something that will continue to evolve over time as computers get bigger and faster, as LES and DNS become more and more doable. From an engineering perspective, we'll be able to rely less on these inaccurate RANS models. But until that's the case, and it'll be quite a long time before it is, in a lot of ways we're stuck with these models. When we get want to get quick, results efficiently in a reasonable period of time.